my name's Sergeant First Class Jake Sullivan, and let me tell you, the day they dropped out of the sky was like something out of a fever dream. I'd always laughed at those tinfoil hat types, the ones going on about little green men and flying saucers. I even teased my buddy Reynolds about it once. He was a good man, Reynolds, a real family man, but he always had this fascination with aliens. Now, I wish I hadn't been so quick to dismiss him. Turns out, he might have been onto something all along. To be fair, these visitors weren't what everyone pictured. No oversized heads or bug eyes, at least not that we'd seen yet. If anything, they looked surprisingly like us. Two arms, two legs, and a head full of messy brown hair the way my kid sister used to have. But what set them apart was that shimmering aura around them, like heat rising off summer asphalt, and the way they just floated in the air. It all started with a blinding flash in the sky. The base shook so hard I thought we were under attack. Me and the rest of my unit had been playing cards, trying to blow off steam between drills. Before we could make sense of it, they were there, three figures bathed in that impossible light. I wasn't scared. Not then. More curious than anything. They just stood there, watching us. I mean, we had guns trained on them ready to unleash hell, and they just didn't seem to care. It didn't make sense. That's when one of them spoke. It wasn't with their mouth. The words seemed to just explode within our heads. Greetings of peace, the thought echoed in my mind, and I'll swear to you, it felt as clear as my own voice. Reynolds was the first to lower his rifle. He dropped to his knees, looking like he'd seen the face of God himself. You speak English? I remember asking, my voice hoarse. Their lips curled into what I think was meant to be a smile. The concept of languages is but a small barrier to us. They went by funny names, Xyla, Zira, and Trill, though they told us those were just convenient approximations of their real ones. Apparently, their form of communication was a lot more complex than what we could ever pick up. But they were fast learners, and it wasn't long before they started stringing together English words, their accents shifting and flowing like rivers changing course. It was Zyla who started asking the pointed questions, her curiosity burning brighter than the shimmering haze engulfing them. They'd come a long way, she said, across a sea of stars that made our minds spin at just the thought. Their world was dying, resources dwindling. They'd sought out planets with the right mix of habitability and signs of intelligent life, which was how they found Earth. Reynolds beamed at them. Here was his cosmic validation. But when they started observing us closer, the smiles and pleasantries faded away. It was like watching someone come to terms with a terrible, life-altering truth. You have mastered remarkable technology, Zira said, brows furrowed with a concern I couldn't quite comprehend back then. Your probes reach the farthest corners of your solar system, your signals stretch into the depths of space, and with every experiment, you inch closer to unlocking the secrets of the universe itself. The pride that swelled within me shriveled under the weight of her next words. Yet you remain confined to this single world. Your transport, it is primitive. Inefficient. There was a silence so thick it suffocated us. Cars. I scoffed, almost insulted, you mean our cars? The three aliens exchanged glances, their expressions a baffling mix of confusion and, pity, maybe? That's when it hit me, a revelation as cold as deep space, they had no concept of wheels, of vehicles the way we knew them. Zyla approached slowly, her movements deliberate, as though approaching a skittish animal. Your species pours resources into constructing these, metal shells. You clear entire swathes of land to lay pathways for them, poison your atmosphere with noxious fumes in the process, create divisions among yourselves based upon their worth. She stopped right in front of me, her shimmery eyes peering into mine with an unreadable intensity. To us, it is an astonishing paradox. You have the potential to reach for the stars, yet you cling to these cumbersome contraptions that bind you to the ground. That's where it really started to get weird. Apparently, they'd mastered something akin to teleportation, mastered the manipulation of gravity even, a way to bypass the need for, well, roads entirely. Watching them demonstrate it was mind-boggling. One moment they'd be standing in front of you, and then, in a blink, they'd be on the other side of the base. Made for one hell of a parlor trick, that's for sure. Why not share this knowledge? Reynolds blurted out, his eyes wide with hope. Can't you imagine what we could do, what we could build? The aliens didn't answer Reynolds right away. They huddled close, a silent, shimmering council deciding our fate. I felt a chill run down my spine, it wasn't fear, exactly, but a sense of being out of my depth, a pawn in a game I didn't understand the rules to. Trill's smooth voice broke through their silent deliberation. While the concept of sharing knowledge is commendable, 
Your understanding of its true weight leaves much to be desired. What's that supposed to mean? I demanded, my temper starting to fray. I don't like being treated like a kid. Zero gestured vaguely towards the window, toward the sprawling base, the rows of vehicles, symbols of our might. For you, technological advancement has been tied to aggression. You build faster planes to drop bigger bombs, sleeker ships to wield stronger weapons. To give a species so fascinated with war the ability to move effortlessly. The consequences are. She didn't finish her sentence. She didn't have to. The weight of her unspoken words hung heavy in the air. Reynolds wouldn't let it go. Look, I get it. We're not perfect. We've got our fair share of problems, he admitted, his voice softer now. But that doesn't mean we can't be trusted. That doesn't mean we can't use this, your technology, for good things. Exploration, reaching out, helping others. He trailed off, the desperation clear in his eyes. Zyda regarded him with a strange sort of sadness. And what of the others you would encounter? Are all species as conflicted as your own? Her eyes drifted back to me, lingering. You defend yourselves vigorously. It speaks of a history steeped in conflict. In that struggle technology becomes a tool, and tools often turn into weapons. That was the turning point, the moment things became less about shiny spaceships and more about a hard, cold look at ourselves. It was the moment I stopped thinking about aliens and started thinking about plain old humans. Reynolds, for all his starry-eyed optimism, was missing the point. We weren't some united force of good, ready to peacefully explore the cosmos. We were a bunch of squabbling tribes who managed to reach for the stars without ever figuring out how to live side by side. That's when the brass showed up. Generals and politicians and those three-letter agency types who materialize out of thin air whenever something strange happens. We soldiers were shooed away, replaced by suits and briefcases brimming with suspicion and self-importance. The negotiations, if you could call them that, lasted for weeks. We caught snippets from the news, filtered through lenses of fear and national security. The aliens were unwavering in their polite refusal, a wall of shimmering, frustrating benevolence. Turns out, you can't strong-arm beings capable of folding space. It's funny, in a twisted sort of way, that it wasn't malice that saved us from ourselves, but a disappointing glimpse of our own reflection. I'll admit, there was a part of me, the selfish, adventure-hungry part, that resented them. They dropped that promise of another world in our laps, only to snatch it away. But the more I think about it, the more I think I understand. Sure, still see cars stuck in rush hour traffic and wish I could just beam myself out of there. I get frustrated by the limitations of our world, the sheer amount of time and energy we spend just getting from one place to another. Yet, if there's one thing those visitors made blindingly clear, it's this, maybe reaching the stars isn't our biggest problem. Maybe, just maybe, we need to figure out how to drive down our own roads before we set our sights on traversing galaxies. Maybe there's progress to be made right here, right now, if we could just get out of our own way. They left as mysteriously as they'd arrived. One morning, the shimmering figures were gone, their parting as swift and silent as a fading dream. News channels erupted in a frenzy of speculation, the world abuzz with unanswered questions, were they coming back? Had we missed our chance? Were they watching? The base emptied out, soldiers reassigned, leaving behind the echoes of alien voices and the lingering scent of a possibility denied. I returned to a civilian life that felt oddly hollow. It wasn't the longing for the stars that gnawed at me, it was something deeper. The aliens, those impossible beings, they'd become a lens, ruthlessly focusing the flaws in my own world. The years slid by, five, then ten. News of interstellar visitors faded into the realm of half-remembered myths. Yet, the world was subtly shifting. I saw it in the renewed push for clean energy, in the cautious, hesitant treaties signed by age-old enemies, in the hopeful gleam in the eyes of young scientists. Humanity, it seemed, wasn't quite as content to be earthbound anymore. Sure, old habits died hard. Gas-guzzling cars still clogged the roads, and war still ravaged parts of the globe. Progress came in fits and starts, often frustratingly slow. But there was an undeniable shift in the air, a lingering echo of that alien disappointment fueling our collective reach for something better. Then came the day that tore the veil of normalcy right off its hinges. It started with a hum, low and persistent, like the droning of a billion angry bees. Not from the skies, but from somewhere deep beneath our feet. The ground beneath the city streets trembled, buildings swaying precariously. I remember the feeling of the earth itself turning restless, that primal instinct to run, to hide. When it finally emerged, it was nothing short of a spectacle. From the rippling asphalt, 
A structure of gleaming metal and pulsating light clawed its way towards the heavens. Sleek, aerodynamic curves that made our boxy cars look like kindergarten toys. My heart hammered a frantic rhythm, was this an invasion, a second coming? Panic rose like a tidal wave in the crowd that had gathered, voices a cacophony of fear and awe. It took agonizing minutes for the massive hatch to slide open. Fear turned to baffled amazement as the passengers stepped into the harsh sunlight. Not the shimmering, otherworldly figures of our alien visitors, but humans. They were dressed in sleek jumpsuits, smiles wide and disarmingly normal. Yet their eyes, their eyes held a spark, a glint of knowing that sent a shiver down my spine. That's when the whispers began, the underground project, those scientists who vanished, rumors of defying gravity. The realization hit like a thunderbolt, we hadn't been waiting for our leap to the stars. We'd been building it ourselves, bit by bit, fueled by a desire sparked by those long-ago visitors. It was the plot twist none of us saw coming. The aliens hadn't given us our ticket to the galaxy, but they had ignited something far more potent, a stubborn determination to build it for ourselves. Turns out, sometimes the greatest leaps forward don't begin on distant planets, but within our own hearts, in the audacity to look beyond the roads beneath our feet, and dare to dream of reaching farther than we ever dared.